Let's get started. We'll, we'll cut right to the chase. How did it go on the exam? I crushed that. I heard I crushed that. Yeah, look at that. So, um, so you guys rocked it on exam one, and I'm very proud of you, and I'm, I, I, I think this is awesome. Um, the average was actually really high, which is, which is great. It means to me that you guys have learned the materials that we want you to learn in the first third of this class. Now, if, um, if there, are, but you know, this is also a chance that if you, if you didn't, you know, get up into this range and you're here or they're down here, or even if you're up here and there are a couple of problems you didn't quite get, this is the, t the time to go back and say, what did I miss, right? How did I misinterpret or how did I, what did I miss? And, and go back over it now, right? And solidify this knowledge. Why? Because of what's coming next. And, and, and I, I really want to contextualize this with something really important um, to me, and that's bread. Now, um, I'll say, if you want to get the best bread in town, you go to Brico, all right? And I, I really actually strongly encourage you all to go to Brico because it's true. It's really the best bread in town. Um, there's Frank. He's, he, he founded uh, Brico. Uh, it's in the South End. It's amazing. Uh, but you, know, you notice his ingredients. There's only seven ingredients in, in the bread at Brico. There's salt, right? Yeast, water. Uh, there's, uh, anybody know what farina is? Flour. Okay, crusca. It's like kind of wheat stuff, right? Uh, oil and passione. Passione. Passion. Passion. It's the thing he's holding. That's ingredient number seven at Brico, which is the best bread in town. Now, here's my point. I need you guys to, to keep bringing the passion <laughs> to this class. You should be bringing the passion to everything you do because that's what we do at MIT, right? That's how we approach everything we do. But I need you not to say, well, I did really well in exam one, and now I can kind of phone it in. That's not the time to do it, trust me. Because now we're going into the next phase, the next third, a little bit less than a third of the class, where we're going to come maybe out of some of our comfort zones. Right? So some of you have seen a lot of the material that we've already covered. Some of you haven't. Um, and some of you may have seen some of the material we're about to cover in the next week or two, shapes of molecules, molecular orbital theory, hybridization, but then we're going to go into crystals. And we're going to take molecular orbitals and we're going to make solid orbitals out of them, which are called bands, which is going to give us semiconductors. And then we're going to dope those with chemistry. All sorts of stuff. So keep up the passion, please. <laughs> That's why I'm showing you Frank and Brico. Keep up the passion. OK. Now today, um, we're going to cover a really important follow-up to Lewis, which is how to, how to predict what shape a molecule will be. And, and so you know, if I take, so for example, H2, B, E, and H2O, you know, those look, right? OK, so H, B, E, H and uh, H, O, H, right? I, from Lewis, we don't really know why they wouldn't both look that way. Are they both linear, right? Are the ones below both linear? How do we tell what shape they are? And as I'll tell you about today, so I'm going to give you a way to do that. And uh, and then a recipe, another recipe just like Lewis, and then um, um, uh, we're, we're going to talk about the goodie bag, which allows you to touch and feel the shapes. You, know, you can't, you know, like, this is, this is, we're going beyond 2D, we're coming out of the board, we're going 3D, you got to hold it in your hand. Now, unfortunately, we couldn't buy like 500 kits that are <laughs> this big, but I'll pass these around because you can just feel in these molecules, you can just feel that if I do this, it's a different molecule. 
It, if I rotate that, it's a different molecule. And it's actually going to have different properties. Right? And so that's what we learned today. Lewis, this, Lewis, this is just all flattened into the board. Mm. Doesn't tell me enough. It doesn't tell, I need to know what those, what, how is this, is it like that? I don't know, do the yellow things want to be that close or should it, you know, maybe be like that or like that? You see how when you can do this, I could do this for hours, honestly. Um, and so that, so I'll pass these around and I'm certain at some point we're going to hear loud clanking sounds <laughs> of these balls falling apart. They're not held together too well. Please try to, try to not, um, and just play with it a little bit, right? And then your kit is a smaller version of that. Okay, so how do we do this? How do I tell you what shape that should be? Well, we have a way to do this, and it's got a name even. Um, yeah, so, so just to contrast, Lewis is what we did last, and Lewis gives me the number and type of bonds, okay? The number of type of bonds. But now I've got a way that's called valence shell electron pair repulsion model. Visiper. Visiper. But see, chemists are, if I haven't conveyed this before, chemists are really good at naming things, right? Yeah. So let's say it could be valence electron shell pair repulsion model. It's not, but it could be. And if it were, we'd call it Vesper. You know, it would sound a lot better, right? And so that's what we call it, even though we write it Vesper. <laughs> so we write it like this, but we say Vesper because this is chemistry. <laughs> and this gives us the shapes. Now, it's based on, actually, a very straightforward premise, which is that electrons repel each other, something we already knew. Okay? Electrons repel each other. And the stable arrangement, I hear that molecule changing shape, it makes me happy. Stable, uh, okay. The stable arrangement minimizes, oh, this makes sense, right? Minimizes the repulsions. OK, that's really the whole premise of Vesper. Vesper theory is a way, it's a very simple recipe that we will learn and apply that is based on this premise. Electro We've already talked about electrons repelling each other in atoms, right? And in a, in a bond. And now we use the same idea that electrons repel each other for a molecule, right? Within a molecule. OK, good. But we need to rank order this. We need to rank order this. And so we have a rank order. And you'll see kind of why um, as we go. But I'll tell, what, I'll tell it to you right now. And I need abbreviations because I, I don't want to keep writing bonding pair and lone pair. So I'm going to say that a bonding pair, a bonding pair. Oh, what's a bonding pair? Well, it's the two electrons in a bond. Right there. That's a bonding pair. Yeah, OK. Good. So a bonding pair, to save time, we're going to write as a BP. And a lone pair, what's a lone pair? Well, we already know that. A lone pair is right there. A non-bonding pair. A lone pair. An LP. OK, good. Now, this allows me, now that I have this very important key, I can create, I can tell you what the repulsion order is without writing out bonding and loan all the time. Repulsion order, and this is what we follow in Vesper. Okay, so we're gonna go, the lowest repulsion is between two bonding pairs. Bonding pair to bonding pair, and the medium, medium, okay, so the next in our list, is bonding pair to lone pair, and the highest is between two lone pairs. All I'm telling you is, in this ordering, is that, okay, so, okay, 
Electrons repel each other. Yeah, got it. But there's an ordering to it. If I'm a lone pair, then, and I see another lone pair, then I'm more repelled. Those two things are more repelled than a lone pair and a bonding pair, which are more repelled than two bonding pairs. And we got one more thing we got to think about because you see, the bonding pairs can be single, triple, or uh, single, double, or triple. Right? And so those have a rank order, which also makes a lot of sense. Right? So like one bonding pair would have uh, uh, you know, a single bond with a single bond would have a lower repulsion than a double bond, which would have less repulsion than a triple bond, right? So like two triple, but that makes a lot of sense, right? That's just, you're putting more electrons in the bond, right? And so there's more stuff to repel, all right? So if I'm talking about bonding pairs, there is also a suborder. Okay, that makes sense, right? So this is like a, a single bond line, two lines, no room, three lines, <laughs> right? Okay, all right, now this frames the Vesper model. Now let's apply it, and the rules are actually really pretty straightforward. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna build our understanding by applying this to some examples. Okay, this is exactly the same thing we did with Vesper. Uh, with Lewis, okay? So I'm gonna start my recipe with the first three ingredients. <laughs> Passion is always there too. But these are the first three ingredients of my Vesper recipe. First, I write the structure. We know how to do that, we learn how to do that. And then I'm gonna classify the uh, pairs of electrons as bonding or non-bonding. So I'm gonna just label them like that, right? And then I'm gonna maximize the separation between domains and pay attention to these rules. And I'm gonna start a little bit of a table over here. Number, because we're gonna fill this table out. Number of electron uh, regions, okay. Let's do this. Oh, you know when I do this, there's nothing but fun coming. <laughs> nothing but fun. I went all the way, all the way over. Why? Because I need some space. Right. Now here we're gonna say electron pair geometry, and we'll be talking about this today. Geometry, okay, good. Mm -hmm. And then here, oh, okay. Now, this is sort of the molecular, molecular geometry. So, I'm going from, I'm going from, you know, counting electron regions and labeling what kind they are, to a geometry of the electron cloud around things to an actual molecular shape, which is what Vesper gives us. And to know why is this so wide, well, because there's options in here, right? Because I could have uh, no lone pairs, all right? I could have one lone pair, and you will, this will all make a lot of sense to lone pairs and so on. We'll keep going as we get there, okay? So I'm gonna start with very simple case. I'm gonna start with this, all right? And then we're gonna put some stuff into that table as we go, all right? So look, if I have H, B, E, H, then that's already point one. I'm gonna write, just like I did with Lewis, I'm gonna write the number of the recipe next to what I'm doing on the board. Okay, so one, write Lewis structure. I did it. Okay, good. Now two, I've got two electron pairs, right? Okay, and they're both bonding. Both are BP. Okay, and so I've got two BP domains and as you can see, I've got no LP domains, okay? And so three, this is gonna be max separation, max sep will have to be linear. There's just no other way about it. I've only got two electron domains. I've got no lone pairs. So two bonding domains, two electron domains. It's gotta be linear. That's the only way I can go. So if the number of electron regions is two, which it is for uh, BEH2, okay, 
And, and then the number of uh, the electron pair geometry is linear, right? Because that maximizes the separations. And there's no lone pairs, and so it's linear. You say, well, that really seems redundant. Well, and it is in this case. Oh, it's not going to stay that way. Not going to stay that way. OK, good. One lone pair, no. No lone pairs. I mean, if I had two electron regions total, OK, and one of them was a lone pair, it's kind of boring. I mean, you know, if this were a lone pair here instead of a bond, well, clearly it's linear. There's only two atoms. Right? So that's kind of the, the simplest case. We won't really talk about that. Good. OK, now, is, is the same kind of thing. Let me just make sure that there's no confusion here. And let's not leave this up. Right? Yeah, but if I had, uh, let's say I, I go back to my first slide there. OK, let's do So what if I had this one? It looks more complicated, right? It looks more complicated. So now, OK, so OK, step one, uh, O and here you go, here you go. And there's a point I want to make here. Because if I count up the bonding pair domains and the lone pair domains on this one, right? Say, well, OK, I've got the, the bonding pairs here, right? I've got some BPs. I've got two BP domains, right, here and here, just like I did in HBEH, OK? But, oh. I've got all these lone pairs now, right? Uh, don't I have four lone pairs? No. And the reason is we have to pick an atom. In Vesper, we have to pick an atom. We're doing this around an atom. Vesper applies around an atom. You pick a central atom, and I picked carbon as my central atom. And then you apply Vesper. So there's no lone pairs around the carbon. That, that doesn't matter for the shape around carbon, OK? That's really important. So I pick my central atom. Now, so now I know there's no lone pairs, no LP, because central atom. You know what I mean, central atom. And then finally, three, we're going to get linear, because again, there's only two electron domains. Right? There's only two electron domains, and the only geometry really that you can take in this case is linear. No lone pairs, two electron domains, linear. Good. And now you know it's about to get fun. Because now we're going to go to something more. Let's go back to our recipe. There it is. OK. So I'm going to make room here and do my next one. I'm going to go a little bit more complicated now. So now I've got. Uh, BF3, so B, and we're going to go F, F, F. And we know we got all these, lone, all these lone pairs out on the Fs. Remember, this is one that's electron deficient. We talked about this last week, all right? Electron deficient. So the boron is happy, even though it's only got those three bonds. But the question is, what's the shape? We've been drawing these structures like this in 2D. What's the real shape, right? And now we can apply Vesper because that's step one. Step two is that I've got three bonding pairs, three BP, BP right? And no LP. OK. And so now, if I have three electron domains, three electron domains, which I have, um, then the max separation for this case, max sep, ah. Max sep is going to be for them to spread out in a trigonal plane. OK? So that's what they're going to do. And that is called uh, trigonal planar. It has a name, trigonal planar. So, you know, it's, it's kind of mm, planar. So it's kind of right, but it's not quite right, because I drew it with 90 degree angles, and that's not what they're going to do to maximize their spacing here, right? They're going to go at angles like that, right? They're going to find 120. But so if I have three electron regions, here we go, then 
Now, I had three, okay, so the electron pair geometry, why is this different? You will see in a minute. The electron pair geometry covers BPs and LPs, but in this case, there's only BPs. Fine, there's still only three, right? And so it's trigonal planar. Trigonal planar. And guess what? If there's no LPs, okay, so the, the structure that the molecule takes of those electron domains takes, sorry, is uh, trigonal planar. The structure that the molecule takes, if there's no LPs, is also trigonal planar. But now, the moment we've been waiting for is what happens when that's not true and you've got a lone pair. So again, we're gonna do this by example. Okay, and so my next example is formaldehyde, which is something we loved to talk about in when we did Lewis. So CH2O, okay, so the Lewis structure for this looks like this, right? We drew this before. O, it's got the lone pairs out here, and then there's H, ah, and another H. That's formaldehyde. Um, okay, now hold on. But there's no, are there any lone pairs here? There's no lone, there's no lone pairs. There's no lone pairs, so hold on. If I go to two, I've got three bonding pairs and zero lone pairs. It looks a whole lot like BF3, but it's different. It's different because now this matters. Now this matters. Right? And so now, yeah, so now I've got to add, so it's like, so three would give you trigonal planar, right? Three gives you trigonal planar because I've only got those three domains, but now I need four. And there's four. Oh, you knew there was something else, right? Give more space to non-bonding domains and to bonding domains with higher bond order. What? That's the fourth part of the recipe. This just goes with what I wrote here, right? So I've got differences in the molecule between the BPs. So you know now that I gotta give more space to this double bond, single bond repulsion than to these two single bonds, right? So part, step four for this case is that the bond order is important. And this molecule will bend. So the shape of the molecule is going to be bent. It will bend because this, I didn't draw it this way. If I wanna be right about it, I'm gonna go like this. Still not quite right, right? And this, this repulsion is stronger than that repulsion, it bends the shape. So it's not trigonal planar. It, the, the electron domains give you a trigonal planar framework, but the molecule itself is bent. Okay, and there's another example of that that we could do. There's another example of that, and that is, let's do it here. And that is if we had the lone pair, which is what I mentioned before. So I'm gonna take another example here, um, which is SO2. And in this case, uh-oh, am I making a mistake? I can hear, I can hear stuff. Did I make a mistake? No, I see this, I did. I do, and that's wrong. <laughs> Bond order is important, but it is not under one low pair. It is not under one lone pair. It would be under here, and it would be, if there's a bond order, it would be bent. If bond order, sorry about that. Bond O. Trigonal planar, trigonal planar, slightly bent. Look at this. Ah. I should have just kept this. Bent. Bent. Because now, 
I've got, look at this. In this Lewis structure, I've got two BP and one LP. And finally, we have the case of the lone pair, and we can fill this column in, and it's bent. And it's bent because, again, it's the same. I go back to this as my key. Okay, so I did bomb pair, bomb pair, but there was a slight shape difference because of the ordering of the bomb pairs. Here, it's gonna be even higher because I've got a lone pair. Actually, it's a lone pair double bond, but it's still stronger than a bond pair, bond pair repulsion. Lone pair, bond pair, right in the middle, is stronger than bond pair, bond pair. That's the rank order. So this will be bent. This will be bent. So three, so I've got three domains, three domains, and hold on, four, LP more repulsive, oh boy, repulsive, and so that gives me uh, bent. Trigonal planar, trigonal planar, bent. Okay, did I get through that without making more mistakes? Okay, now, oh, yes. so we're gonna go further than this, which is why this is only the beginning. But before I do, I say, why does shape matter? I told you shape mattered in the very beginning, but why does it matter, right? Let's say, isn't it just important to know what the chemistry is and not the actual shape? Why does the shape matter? And so I thought I would give you an example of that um, with smell, and, and I, yeah, right? Exactly, and I actually think we should do this more often. I, you know, I feel like this is inspiring. We talk about stopping and smelling the flowers, but do we actually do it? And look at that, they've got, you know, one arm around the other. This is a moment. You can't share this moment on Instagram. You have to put your phone down and be there to have this moment. And I highly encourage you to be inspired by this. Now, smell and taste are actually related, and smell is, um, you know, it's actually a fascinating thing. It, we can smell about 10,000 uh, uh, different smells. Um, it's remarkable, uh, a dog can smell between 10 and 100,000 times more, right? So if you, if you do the analogy that people do with vision, we can see a third of a mile, a dog could see about 3,000 miles, right? Uh, that's pretty cool. Um, um, but the question is, why do we smell? How do we smell? How do we taste? And it turns out that the way that we distinguish from one smell and one taste and another has to do with the shape of the molecule. And so just like a key, right? In it, with a key, there's not, it's all the same material, it's the same chemistry in the key, but the shape is different, that can unlock the door or not. That is literally how our receptor cells work for taste and smell. Um, this is a cartoon I found that I kind of like. See, okay, shapes, circles, squares, right? Uh, okay, and some shapes come in and they make happiness. Happiness, flowers and stuff, cheese, I don't know. Is cheese happy? It looks neutral. I would get happy with cheese. But anyway, uh, fish for some reason, but you know, it depends. And, but it's shape dependent. Now the thing is, taste works that way too. So this is what's happening in your tongue. You've got these, these, uh, these taste buds. We've all heard the word taste bud, right? But what is really going on? What is really going on is a combination of chemistry and shape recognition. Um, so, so the taste bud, if you look at the taste bud, that's inside of the little, these little pores inside your tongue. There's a blow up of it. And so this is what the surface of your tongue looks like and there's a little pore and there's little filters in there that help certain molecules, you know, kind of get in there. And what happens when they get in there? Well, what happens is you've got these taste receptor cells that are like lock key pairs. They actually only look at like the circle or the diamond and they can tell you which one is which. And that's a major part of how we distinguish from one shape uh, to another. And it, it's actually so, um, uh, uh, it's, it's, it goes back a long way. Why? Because shape and smell are, are literally uh, survival. They are literally like you can, you know, 
if you taste something and it's and it and it tastes poisonous, don't eat it. You live. <laughs> right? So it is it is a very emotional thing to smell and taste because it is actually coupled to uh, to your very survival. And Democritus himself, Democritus, Democ our friend Democritus said that shape must be involved. He thought that because things that taste bitter are sharp, that the bitter molecules were sharp. They must have sharpness to them, and like, like shards of glass. That's how he imagined it, and the sweet molecules were sort of these soft, fluffy spheres, right? But that's not that far off from being sort of what happens a little bit. <laughs> but when we look at like, you know, glucose, and, and quinine, we say, okay, those are very different chemistries. So it might not be as obvious why one of them tastes so different than the other. But check out this example. This is the same molecule, the carbonyl molecule, that is called an enantiomer, which means that it has handedness. It's the exact same chemical formula and the exact same structure, except for one is like this and one is like that. That's handedness, right? And that difference makes one of them taste and smell experiment and the other like caraway seeds, right? It's incredible. It's it means that in our tongues, in our noses, we must have chiral, uh, the ability to, de to determine the chirality. It's pretty cool, right? So shape is critical and this is one example of why. This is one example of why. Okay, back to my, back to my Vesper recipe. Now, we got to go a little further because this is three electron domains. Three electron domains, they can be messed around. They can be messed around, right? Especially in this table, we're talking about lone pairs or not. Okay, I gave you the example, which I kind of fudged in there with uh, bond order. But what happens if I go to four? So if I go to four, let's do an example with four. If I go to four, I need some room here. Why don't I do it in the center here? Okay. Let's do an example of all possibilities with four, with four domains. And there's three really good examples, right? And you know them. Let's do CH4. So we'll do these kind of more quickly. CH4, gesundheit, which would be C, H, mm, never leave enough room on top, and H, there, there it is. Okay, anyway, uh, and NH3, okay, so N, H, 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 and H2O. Now, O, H, H, this is how I drew it on the first slide, or this is how I drew it up there before. Now, the thing is that in each of these cases, what I want you to see in these, four, in these three examples is their similarity first. And their similarity is that if I pick my central atom, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, if I pick my central atom um, and I look around it, each one has four electron domains, right? So in this sense, the kind of overarching electron pair ge geometry is identical for all three of those cases. It's identical, right? And it's tetrahedral. Tetrahedral. Okay. That's the electron pair geometry that's exactly the same. But I need to now count, I need to now, oh, there's the recipe. I need to now classify the electron pair as bonding or non-bonding and then maximize the separation between do domains while giving more space to non-bonding domains and bonding domains with higher bond order, as we have now talked about. So if I do that, here what I have is four bonding pairs, zero, zero lone pairs. Here I've got three bonding pairs, one lone pair, and now I really get to fill in stuff in my table, because now I've got the examples of zero, one, and two lone pairs for the same 
electron domain cloud. Okay? So there's 0, 1, and 2. What, and you can see in, in methane, okay, the only way for this to maximize its repulsion, they're all the same bonding pair. They're all single bonds. So there's not going to be any kind of funny business of a double bond pushing harder. Um, and there's no lone pairs. And so this is just going to have the tetrahedral shape. That will be the shape of the molecule. That is the electron domain shape as well. So in this case, it will be tetrahedral. Tetrahedral. OK. But see, now, in this case, I've got three bonding pairs and one lone pair. And we know, because of the Vesper recipe, which has, oh, it's up there. I keep forgetting it's up there. Uh, OK. We know that I want to maximize the separation, but I've got to give more space to the non-bonding, because the lone pair bond repulsion is stronger. Good? So what that means is it's, it's going to be sort of like tetrahedral, but I'm but in one place, there's no bond. There's just this lone pair pushing down. And so the shape that you're going to get is called uh, trigonal, trigonal pyramidal. Pyramidal. OK, because I've got, because now th that's just the way that shape looks. So this is going to, I'll show you actually a picture of this in a sec. OK? of what this looks like. Um, and then with water, we now know that this will not be the most stable configuration, because these lone pairs are pushing on these bonds too much. So water is actually going to look like this, where these guys, the lone pairs, can come out like that, right? at angles like that, be away from each other. right? And then the bonds are down there, and that's going to maximize the shape of the water, I mean, the the it's going to minimize the repulsions that the electrons feel in water. And that is back to the same name, which is bent. So I've got, four, I've got a different number of electron domains, but I wind up with the same molecular shape. Right? You will see that? Bent. Tetra now, I know this is <laughs> kind of small. I've got tables that has, have all this at the end that you'll have in the slides. Okay, so I, so I know this is a little bit crammed in here, but the process of writing this is very, very fun and fulfilling. Now, we can keep going, but I want to tell you about a labeling system that's actually really helpful. So if, you know, if, we, if we keep going, we kind of want a system to be able to think about these things. And so we, there is a system. Again, this is chemistry. We know how to name things. Oh, but I promised you I'd show you that first. So here it is. <laughs> there it is. I, but I don't know why I didn't click to that already. That's this, right? And, and the reason I want to show you this, this is, the, um, uh, this is from Averill, your textbook that you're all reading so carefully. And look at that. This really brings it home. Look at that lone pair. Now you're seeing it as the electrons feel it, which is a probability distribution cloud. That's the lone pair. And now you can see the lone pair wants space. It wants room. And it's pushing down on these bonds, which are pushing away from each other. right? And that's how you can figure out what shape it is. Trigonal pyramidal. That's trigonal pyramidal. OK? The molecule. Now, um, now OK, right. As I said, we need a way to, to label things. And chemists are really smart. So we keep going, linear. Trigonal planar, tetrahedral, trigonal bipyramidal, oh, five, octahedral, six. Don't get confused, octa, eight, but octahedral uh, uh, is, is for six electron pair domains, right? But we need a system to name this. And so the chemists have brilliantly come up with AXE. Now, A is the central atom, X is the bonding pair regions, and E is the lone pair regions. Right. X and E. OK. And so if I go back to like BF3, well, this would be, oh, there you go, AX3. I say, what is the shape of AX3? I know I've got a central atom A, and I've got three bonding pairs around it, and no lone pairs. That's what that means. Right. I, I could go back to SO2. Where's SO2? Did I erase it? Maybe I erased SO2.
I did erase SO2. Oh, I didn't erase SO2. Happiness, look at this. SO2 would be A X 2 E. Or if you want, you could put a one there. It's a highly sophisticated advanced labeling system <laughs> that simply allows us to keep going, to keep going without writing so many words. Out, right? But we know now, A is the central atom, X is the number of bonding pair regions, and E is the number of lone pair regions. And we know about our rules, and we know about bond order. right? So now, if I look at those same, <laughs> really? What happened to, oh, there they are up there. If I look at those same ones, well, OK, look, those are tetrahedral, OK? The electron pair distribution is tetrahedral, but, gesundheit, um, but as you can see in these pictures, you can get three different molecular shapes. You can get tetrahedral, same as the electron pair. You can get trigonal pyramidal, or you can get bent. Those are the names of the molecule, right? Notice that those aren't the names that include the lone pairs. The lone pairs are how you find which one of these categories you're in. But those are the names of the molecules. Those are really important, those names of the molecular shape. Right? Now, if I move over one, OK, so oh, there they are, names. Tetrahedral, trigonal, pyramidal, bent. Now, let's move over one. So now I'm going to stop. I'm not going to keep on writing everything down. Let's do one last example. So here's trigonal bipyramidal. This is what happens when you have five electron pair domains. Now again, and I keep saying this, but I, I know that this can lead to confusion later. So I, I keep on iterating um, or reiterating. The electron pair domain count, right, the five here, the five here, which gives us this overall kind of electron pair domain shape. That would be five there, right, trigonal bipyramidal. That includes you know, a single, double, or triple bond is a domain. It's a BP, right? It's a BP domain. A lone pair is a domain. How many of those do you have floating around your molecule, around your atom, sorry, your central atom? And then you go down and you sort of decompose it in terms of how many of them are, are bonding pairs, Xs, versus how many of them are lone pairs. So let's do, let's do one. Last example, and it'll be for five. It'll be for five, right? So five, and I want you to really I'll go with the center again. I want you to really kind of get a feeling for why this works. And, and this is, I think, a nice example. Um, if you had the molecule if you had the molecule SF4, I'm giving you two examples today that violate the octet rule, right? Because chemistry lives in the fast lane. If you have SF4, you, S is willing to have an expanded octet, right? Uh, 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 as you go down in the periodic table, atoms are more willing to live in the fast lane and break the rules. S, we've drawn it like this, F, 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 all right? We've drawn it like this, violating the octet rule and all that, but still being happy because it's lowest in energy. And these are all my, uh, my electron non-bonding domains. Ah. OK. Now, if I count, remember, those aren't going to matter. They're on the outside. I'm picking one atom. A is S, right? A is S in this case. And in this case, I've got, um, you know, I've got, okay, how many bonding pairs? I've got five, four bonding pairs and one lone pair and one lone pair. And, and so you can see, right, I can just look this up here. AX4E1, it must be a seesaw structure. But I want you to see it. And this is where playing with these models really helps you see it. Because you know, if you think about this, it seems at first that if I had four bonding pairs and one lone pair, why can't I just write it like this? 
this seems like a good idea at first, right? S, and then you got a flooring down here, and then you're gonna go out. Oh, I'm using a kind of cool new notation here, all right? And then you're gonna go, did somebody just say whoa? Or is that just in my mind? Like that? But I'm saying whoa. That's a terrible rendition of this notation. But this means, see, now I've got to come out of the board. And for me, that's challenging, because I'm not very good at drawing 3D things. And so we use these little, these little th shaded in kind of sticks like that, and, and it comes out of the board, and then that's like the dashed one, and it goes into the board, All right? So there's one, <laughs> that looks terrible. <laughs> All right, I'll try one more time. So maybe if I just do this, F, F, and this is in the same plane here. These three are in a plane, and that's going down, and you've got your, your lone pair up here. That looks pretty good. Why is that better than something like this? And now one coming out of the board and the other going into the board, right? And now this would be Gesundheit. This would be my other possibility. You know, I mean, if I think about it, I think, why can't it just be this? These look, I don't know, these look nice and spread out. Why not? It's the lone pair again. It's the lone pair. It's got to be because, you know, I, I put up there somewhere that's now not there. Mm. That the lone pair repels the bonds more. And I've got more than, than, than say, a bond in a bond. But in, the point is that I've got three of those here. This has three. One, two, and three. This has two. This is a happier structure, right? So I wanted you to, so this is a way to think about it. You're using Vesper, you're applying these principles, right? I mean, it's just a four point recipe, but I'm hoping that in thinking about it this way and in having the little models in your hand, which you have um, in this goodie bag, that you guys uh, will also kind of have a feeling for it. So that yes, you have the tables that are written out much better than, than how I wrote them out. And here's one in the lecture notes that I'll leave you, right? Total domains, it's very similar. Notation, right? Structures, okay? Shapes. But also that you have a feeling for why this is the case. All right? Shapes and molecules. See you guys on Wednesday. No, Friday.